Well, good morning and or good afternoon, uh, as the case might be. Uh, welcome or welcome back to our next episode in the series entitled Conversations with Tech Leaders Shaping the Future of Canada. My name is Dalibor Petrovich and I'm a partner at Deloitte. I've had the pleasure of hosting this series uh, for the last, uh, well, almost two years now. Um, and for those of you who are returning, you know that we've had the pleasure to speak with certainly uh, what I would consider to be an absolute top tier of Canadian technology leaders across the country and across the industries and organizations of different sizes. Um, today is going to be an excellent, excellent conversation. We have a luminary of Canadian technology industry joining us today. But before I do the introduction, um, I would just like to uh, thank the CIO Strategy Council and Deloitte for helping us coordinate host uh, these particular sessions. Um, uh, as you may know, the this conversation will be about 45 minutes long, and we have reserved some time for your questions. So if you would like to directly engage and submit a question to, to our guest, uh, please do so using the Q&A function, and uh, we'll be tracking the questions and then and then asking them. So with that, we are now a couple of minutes in. I have an absolute pleasure to, to welcome Harry Pickett. Harry is the Executive Vice President and CIO of Cooperators. Hello, Harry. Uh, well, Harry, thank you very much for finding the time to be with us. I can only imagine how busy yeah. your schedule is. Mm -hmm. It is, and, and, and you're welcome. I, I look forward to this uh, event, to any time to share, you know, personal experiences and where I can help the industry think maybe a little differently than we're thinking today. It's a, it's a great opportunity, so I appreciate you, you inviting me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Harry. So, um, of course, I have many questions to ask, um, but where I often like to start is to simply, um, you know, ask my guests to tell us their story. I would certainly not do you mm -hmm. justice by introducing you other than to say that you lead the technology portfolio for one of Canada's largest and most well-known insurance companies. So, but that is only the, the tip of, of, the, of the pyramid of your life experience. And I'm keen to hear more. So Harry, over to you, tell us your story. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I guess uh, I, I can go way back uh, when my, I guess for <clears throat> people know or don't know, but I mean, I was I was born on a farm in the eastern townships in Quebec. And uh, and if I would have thought someday I would be, you know, the EVP and CIO of cooperators, I probably would have tilted my head and said, I don't think so. So <laughs> it's been an interesting journey to to get here, if you will. I'll start on the life side. I mean, I. Um, I guess, you know, even those grassroots, you develop a work ethic and there's all there's a correlation between work hard and probably do well. So that's mm. served me well through my career. I mean, when I first started working in the, I guess you could say in the city on my first jobs, I think I was told to go home because the days, seven and a half, eight hours didn't seem much compared to a 12 hour day. Um, one of the things that I appreciated as I went through different jobs and you can see my jobs in the LinkedIn profile, I always look at as being what I would say humble and respectful because you never know mm -hmm. where the gold is in terms of talking to people and their experience and 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 where you believe they have something to contribute. I guess I'm a I'm a very much of a glass half full person. I believe everybody's here to contribute something meaningful and just give them the time to have that conversation. I you know I'm I'm very I think because of uh, the my different jobs that I've had I I appreciate very much diversity. And inclusivity. I think it's really important nowadays to to understand that you know there's there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, we'll probably have a question around that in Canada, but how you how you look at those opportunities and how you basically deploy uh, those in in the industry. So um, one of the things though I thought was interesting when I when I was thinking about this question is I always look for what I call stretch opportunities, things that mm. might take you out of your comfort zone, things that you might say, well, you know, some, I think I can do that, but hey, you know something, I'm prepared to put a bet on myself, if you will, and that, that I, I'm going to do that job and I'm going to do it really well. And I always 
always tried to set the bar slightly higher than what I would believe would be good, yeah. if you will. So, uh, and, it, and it served me well as a principal in my life. On the career side, I think one of the things I've recognized right from the beginning is, I mean, I was basically, you know, raised in financial services. And, and one thing about the big banks, I mean, I worked for BMO, you'll see that. Um, it was, it was, an, it was a, a wonderland of opportunity because of the diversity of the portfolios. And I mean, I've been working in tech, but I had chances to do different roles and jobs on that. And I found out, you know, being a team player, it was also very beneficial to, when I say team, I'm talking not just the team that works for, but a broader team experience on how you be, you know, to bring other people into your tent and how you participate in theirs, if you will, in conversations. I also felt that one of the things that served me well is curiosity. I mean, I've always been curious mm -hmm. about things and say, well, how does this work? And, 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 and understand it well enough to be able to, to either further explore it to say, is that a career opportunity I would like to explore, but not just understand where I was in my career, but where are the other opportunities in the organization to build? And one of the things that I think is a challenge for a lot of people is that people ask you that question, like, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Like, what, what is your career aspiration? I kind of approach that question in sort of medium, short term, long term, like in the short okay. term, I think I'd like to do this, the medium term. My long term was always a little fuzzy because I wasn't quite sure where I would land in my medium and short term assignments. There's one thing, though, that I really feel has been a differentiator in my career is that I've had like three different lives within business. And, and one was mm. a basically a consumer of services. So I either when I say that is when I worked in, you know, Manulife for CIBC, where I consume services. It could be from Deloitte. It could be from IBM, that, as a, but also a provider. So as a consumer provider. Mm -hmm. When I was um, when, when we built a company called Simcor, it was a it was a company that we built essentially from BMO, Royal Bank, and TD. There, I became a provider of services. So it's a different it was a different lens. It's so like, okay, so I'm going now from a consumer to a provider, and it's had a different set of engagement rules and standards and that type of thing. And then I also had a chance to work for a couple um, con, you know consulting agents, you know Deloitte being one of them. And the cool part about that was, is that it's, you know, you became a consultant to be able to start sharing. So when I look at a business problem, I often look at it from, I triangulate on three. So am I consuming this service? Am I now being a consultant around it, particularly around a business partner relationship I might have? Yeah. Or am I actually being, you know, the, let's say the provider itself of what we're doing? So it's, it's served me well. And the other thing I've, I've thought about is I always try to look through life very much through a business lens. I mean, the business, when I talk about that, it's, it, it, I, I typically understand where I am, but it's also really important to understand who you're, so taking, you know, the old adage, like put like try on their shoes and see what it looks like sort of thing. And that's allowed me to build really strong uh, business relationships with my counterparts. And, and I guess the other, the last point I would make on this particular question is, is really put yourself or I, I put myself out there. I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to bet on myself. I think I'm 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 confident, I'm, but I'm not cocky about what I do. I uh, I feel that I've been able to look at opportunities and say, you know something, I think I can really contribute to that in a meaningful way. But I will also be honest enough with myself to say, no, that's not that's not my that's not not that's not my wheelhouse. I'm not going down that route. It might be interesting, but I so and 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 the last part that I've really kind of landed on, like EVP CIO at Cooperators. Yeah, this is a true story, by the way. Somebody phoned me up, I won't say the <laughs> firm, and said they were, you know, they're looking for somebody that could go in as a, you know, as a role, as a transformation role within cooperators. So I was originally thinking the person talking, I was talking to was asking me, well, you know, do you know anybody? And then I realized about, you know, five minutes that they were actually talking about me. And I thought, mm. oh, wow, that's kind of interesting. So, so then I, so, so it's just, you never know exactly. So the moral of the story is you never quite know you know, where, where, where your reputation, what it is, but apparently, like you said, and I've, you know, I have a reasonably good reputation in the marketplace and they were actually looking for me, which was very flattering, which yeah. resulted in some, into some really interesting interviews with the CEO and some of my, I would call peers and our management committee. And here I am, I'm cooperators, uh, CIO, and I've been here for eight months and I'm having a fabulous time. It's, it's about as fun as it gets. This is fantastic. Anyway. Like this was sort of, the, 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 your response was bursting with wisdom. So here, here are key things that I've captured. You started by mm -hmm. saying humble and respectful, right? 
and you mm-hmm. look at life as from a positive perspective, glass half full. You also mentioned curiosity as the key element of your success, looking at it from different perspectives. I think that's actually really important to, to, to look at a problem from a provider perspective, from a consumer perspective, from a consultant perspective. That's an actually interesting model to think about. And then lastly, wrapped up with the importance of empathy, putting mm-hmm. yourselves in other shoes, uh, but also betting on yourself, not being cocky, but being honest and always looking for the little bit of a stretch. This is actually, yep. this, this is a, like, we, you could run a course like this at, a unit, at the <laughs> MBA, right? So, uh, so yeah. b- before we move off the topic of, of your sort of mm-hmm. story, professional story, I'd be curious to know, Harry, how did you actually end up in technology field? You, 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 you've been in this field, you mentioned for over 30 years, I, I read yeah. on your LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And why I'm asking is because um, in these interviews, we've, we, I speak to CIOs often, and they come from completely different backgrounds. I've got artists, engineers, accountants, teachers, lawyers. How did you end up in tech? Wow, that's a that's a that's an interesting question. Um, I um, this is you know, this is a funny story. So I think I went to Montreal, you know. I finished school, you know, I, 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 I've always targeted that educate. I don't have an MBA. I'll be the first to declare that, but I've always targeted my, let's, let's call it education around what I would call just in time or things that I needed. Yeah. So I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So I was going to go to Montreal and I thought I was going to sign up and be an encyclopedia salesman. So I thought, Oh, that, that <laughs> would be a good, so I, but one of my friends was working in Bell Canada and he suggested, why don't you go talk to Alcan because you've got a lot of attributes that I think they could use. And it was mm-hmm. where I kind of started my career. And uh, so at that time I was, I was involved in DOS and electrotechnology. So I was taking, you know, so I, I had selected a field at that time. Yeah. The, the most practical part about that though, is I was actually doing the job as I was learning the job. Like they were like the courses were like, you're going to learn this today. And I'm saying, I'm already doing that. So, the, so yeah. it was a, it was a dry, very tight connection between, between that. And then I explained, and then it was a great place because it was a small shop. And for anybody out there, small shops are fun because you get to do a lot of different things. Yeah. I mean, when you work in like a bank of Montreal or a Royal, they're big shops and you typically have to be in your swim lane. Those small shops, you can traverse across a number of different swim lanes. And I started the, my career that way of the traversing back and forth. So, so it allowed me to be very curious about well, what is this role about? What is that role about? That type of thing. And I got to practice that. And then when BMO was, was advertising, they were moving then very aggressively into online banking. I made a big leap from there to there. And that's where mm. my career kind of really took off in terms of working in big organizations. But I've had a, an interesting experience. I've worked in large and I worked in what I would call medium, and I've worked in small. Mm-hmm. And the, the diversity of those roles are very interesting because they all bring something different. Small, yeah. small has probably a more urgent sense of need of, of, of how you would actually you know, get things done at a very, I would say, very minimalistic price point, where if you're very large, you can afford yeah, to make bigger bets and, and maybe fail more often and still be viable, if you will, if I'm making sense. But that was my, so my venture into, so technology roles from there just became a natural thing to do. But they were different. They were very different though, like everything from business systems management to application development, to be a chief technology officer. So I was, I was, I guess it was like the menu I was looking through and, and it wasn't actually by design. And then I started looking back thinking, wow, this is, this is reasonably cool because I've got a, now I've got an interesting way to start capitalizing on this experience. How's the best way? Do I aggregate this experience and then play it forward to a next potential job opportunity? So now you are at the helm of the cooperators, one of the largest insurance companies. You mentioned you'll be there for eight months with explicit purpose to sort of transform the organization. I'd love mm-hmm. if you could share with us a little bit about like, what is the strategy? What are, you, what are the cool things you're working on? And what mm-hmm. might be some challenges that you are facing and how you're dealing with those? Uh, that's that's a great question. So the timing of this job couldn't be better. So Cooperators was just coming off what they call their their four year plan, 2019 to 2022. So it was a it was a business plan that was basically you know you know I guess interlocked with the board that this is what we're going to do. We had certain themes about building a bridge, but we also identified areas in the marketplace that we are going to have to get much more aggressive, particularly in digital, as an example. 
because insurance, I think, is, I mean, generally understood is probably not as far advanced as probably the banking community. I'm not saying that to, to be, you know, uh, to, to, to take a shot at anything, but the reality was. So when I looked at that four year plan, I really wanted to understand, so how could I make a difference? And so during the interview process, they were talking about very specific uh, projects like like digital for our quote and buy, which we just we just launched quote, I think, uh, in July, actually, and buy as a and we have a, a release coming up on that with Guidewire to cloud, there's a number, I mean, it doesn't really bring on the can, but the projects themselves. But the other piece that really interested me was the talent, we had a talent reset component. And what that was focused on is saying, okay, if we can paint the future, what does that look like? Like, how does the IT organization need to pivot? to support that. So, so we went through a very deliberate exercise of looking at, so the first thing we did is I, I interviewed the business. I mean, I, and we came up with five or six business imperatives saying, this is absolutely where IT or tech has to hit the ball out of the park. We then transcribed that into what I would call an IT strategy. And it's not that we were missing a lot of pieces, but we were really putting together a, a, a playbook about what that future was going to look. And the last piece of the puzzle, we just finished up the operating model, which is to say, well, given those business imperatives, given this IT strategy, how do we have to start positioning ourselves in the future to basically to enable the business strategy that we're going to support? So, and, and the interesting parts about this is that there's some very big changes coming up, right? For, so we're going to move, digital moves everybody into a 724, whether you realize it or not, but organizations are not necessarily designed to run 724. Banks are because they've been doing online banking and ABMs and that forever, but some other industries are not. So that's kind of a delta change. And then the other thing that I've noticed is that the pace of investment and the change management effort around what we're doing is a significant challenge to get because there's like, I think in some cases we can develop faster perhaps and we can implement and, but you know, good technology projects you know, they could be the best in the world, but unless they are assimilated by the business and, and that and it's done well, you could end up with a project that has a black label that could be a perfectly really good project. And then, you know, from, from essentially the, what I would call sort of that customer feedback constantly, and you'll find this entertaining. So one of the things I had noticed when I first came in, we were trying to explain to the business in technology terms, what we were doing. So I flipped the report and said, why don't we explain to the business and what we call our quarter operating report, what we are doing and link it directly to their objectives. So we removed the Technobob from the report and just put in, so it's a report that they can consume. So it can be used to show, and we built chapters in this quarterly operating report that would resonate with PNC manufacturing, with yeah. our life company, with our sovereign, our different entities. So, so the other probably takeaway on this part of us was is really that translation or tell our story because we've got to tell our story better because yeah. we have a good story to tell and i'm sure most technology organizations do but i'm not so sure they do it as well as they could to understand really what and and, and i and, and i i call it the unsung heroes just keeping the lights on every day under those people that because if you're if your systems are not up you're not talking about projects you're talking you're having a different conversation yeah. so that whole thing about maintaining business continuity and what we call advancing the business model has been really important. So I don't know if I've touched on some of your question there, but that's kind of how I see that. So an exciting time to be in cooperators right now, because we're now updating the next four year plan. Mm -hmm. And and I'm a, a key part of that conversation. I mean, I report to Rob Westling, who's our CEO. So it's nice to have that straight through processing type of relationship. I mean, to be able to be and, and leverage experiences that we have that 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 I personally have that I can bring value to the company. Yeah. What what I, what I uh, t take so uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for 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 being so candid uh, about sort of how you are approaching the strategy and implementation. What I really love uh and I'm going to take away from this is what you mentioned about change management and I think we we are seeing this now as 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 our industry matures and our industry mm -hmm. matures i remember the times when you know the problem was the, when when the the budget was tight the first thing that cios would cut is the investment in change management the, I, I think those days are over and i'm really they are too. glad to 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 hear you say um that um and then telling the story that the, this this ability 
to actually communicate with our clients in the language that that humans can actually understand and linking it mm -hmm. to what is valuable to them. That is, I think, very powerful. Uh, I wanted to ask, you, you mentioned one of the challenges that you already see. Well, change management is a challenge and not, we know that. Mm -hmm. right? You can have a successful yeah. technology project, quote unquote, on time, on budget, on scope and still fail if you haven't addressed the consumer user to change management. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one interesting thing. You're moving into the digital realm, which, like it or not, is 24-7, and organizations might not be configured. That is actually a very serious, obviously, challenge. What might, like, when you look about the next three, four years, what might you observe would be some other potential challenges that, you, that, that, that would be interesting or that you might be thinking of, like that one? Um, I think, you know, it, it, it might lead into... I, I, generally companies are transforming right mm -hmm. so there's a there's a talent and staffing component to that conversation yeah and and it's, and a skill set because if i look back and i said so what's changed in like at, at one time people built data centers they ran data centers mm -hmm. now they're basically consuming let's call it services yeah. from the aws's the azures the other you know the googles of this world so if you look at each of the disciplines, they're all changing in terms of everything from application development to INO services to end user computing, you know, what, what intelligence you see on the network. And I think that the embracing of that change and understanding that there, I mean, there, there, there's a bit of a stuck in the old world. I, I could say it differently. But that world is going to be changing and, and there's got a there's a there's a component of reinvention that I think people have to think about. It's like it's hard to make an omelet without breaking an egg sometimes. Right. So if you're thinking yep. about your, your staff and, and, and your, your talent strategy, you say, OK, so where are we today? What does that DNA composition look like and what does it need to look like? And what does that journey look like from a training and development? And we have a simple philosophy here. We may not get in reality the talent we need to do what we want to do. So you do one or two things. You say either I grow it and develop it, and that could take and with and with the talent shortage in the marketplace today, or what they call the, you know, there's because the, that's I mean that's not new to anybody. That hiring people is difficult, if you will, simply because of demand. It forces you to think about who do I want to partner with, mm -hmm. and who do I, and and how do I do work differently. I, I've introduced a, a, a phrase here at. Um, Cooperators that says, what do you want to be famous for? Anyway, like what, if you want to be famous for something, what do you want to be famous for? And it may not necessarily mean that you that imaging a laptop may not be something because everybody does that. So you might say, well, that type of role, maybe it's more of commodity and perhaps we could have somebody else do that more effectively. But if you're truly looking to differentiate yourself, you have to look at what is the secret sauce? Yeah. Uh, it says, hopefully it's not my computer. Oh my goodness. Okay, restart. Let me just hold that. That's uh, okay. Restart. Hopefully, this doesn't uh, the software push. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, this is what sometimes happens with the live interviews, ladies and gentlemen. So it looks like um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, of course, let uh, uh, let Harry restart his laptop. I'm going. I don't know how long this might take. So uh, uh, let's uh, let's give this a pause for a minute. Um, I did receive a number of questions that we will ask Harry when he comes back. Carry on bravely. So there we go. So Harry, we were just wrapping up on the challenge challenges, yeah. and then the the software update comes. So <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to have to talk to my CISO. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as, as I said to the, like we had, we, we have, uh, as, essentially we've lost, I think only two people from the audience. That's, I think, how interesting this conversation is for people. Oh, so good, good. I want to thank I, everybody. I, I apologize. I apologize to our followers for that, but it, it's actually quite <laughs> funny, isn't it? It this is. This is going to turn into a good, this is going to turn into a good story someday. Perfect. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. So, so, so Harry, um, let's, let's maybe move off of cooperators for a moment. I would yeah. love to get your perspectives. You are obviously a very successful professional in, in tech industry. Um, a lot of experience, different roles in different industries, in, including consulting. 
uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on what what are the key attributes of a successful technology leader, CIO, um, and how have you seen this role evolve over the last mm-hmm. maybe couple of decades? Where do you think this role might be heading and what kind of, what would be needed? What are those skills and attributes you think that are needed by, by, by the successful future CIOs? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think the, the fundamental change that we've seen in the industry is, is that CIOs now report to CEOs. I mean, mm. if you think about early days, there was, you know, they reported up to the CFO organization. They typically didn't have what I would say direct line of sight into the executive committee. I think very progressive organizations are recognizing that they need to be part of the executive committee because in some cases, the technology itself is going to be part of the business strategy, as, as an example. I. Um, you know, and I was talking a little bit before my security patch went up about what's changed, like what's like, like understanding what's changed in, in the marketplace from building data centers to consuming services in areas of application development to what, how we do application development today, waterfall to agile to how we're, and, and, and one of the things that I, I think is, is that whole transformation, not only of the business, but how does IT align a transformation to be able to continue to respond and, and update against it because I've seen organizations essentially out of sync with that. The yeah. business is being very progressive, but the organization feels that technology is a bit of a boat anchor that they're dragging along to get them to change. And one of the pivot points that I think in a successful organization is this is for tech to get ahead of the business, to try to understand what's likely coming down, to do a proper assessment of what skills do we really need? What skills do we have? And how do we best fill those skills to move forward? And, and there's a currency issue here because if you want to stay relevant, you got to, in my opinion, you have to reinvent yourself. You have to be able to start thinking, live the future, think the future, that type of thing about how are we going, not only to make yourself uh, not, not necessarily indispensable, but, but, but it to be useful to, to the organizations you're working for, but also to help guide them because there is so much, you and I talked about this one time, I think, Valibor, there's just so much literature out there about where you can go. It's like you walk into and it's like a, it's like a restaurant that has 4,000 things on the menu and you say, where do I start? So I think one of the things we need to do is very, choose very wisely on where we want to double down our bets because there's just so much out there of what we want to be famous for, what we want to be good at. And then, and then start targeting some research around what are the best leading practices around that? Like, not just don't depend on your own intuition, but you know, collaborate with you know the Deloitte's of this world, or whether it's the research board or other partner, that type of thing, where you're getting, in lots of cases, as much as you can, external validation because there's so much to be learned by each other, and and the CIOs being in communities that they can share either these ideas or these thoughts moving forward. So, so I think that, and and, and the other thing is if you look at so how do you spend your, what's a day in the life of a CIO look like? You might say, you know, at one time, maybe it was very inwardly focused, but right now I would probably submit, I would spend over 50 or 60% of my time with my business partners. And my, and my organization is, is linked right directly into those business partners in terms of strategy development and enablement, but it's also how you want to spend your time and where do you want to, and where you think you can best influence. And I think in the past, that's, I think that one could say, oh, we've been there for years. But I think in lots of cases, we haven't been there for years. And that connection is becoming so much more stronger and potent- potentially influential role, even at the board where we're making, you know, where we talked about um, things that are happening in the technology front. Some boards are more, if you want to call it, are more educated than others in terms of how tech operates within their companies. But there's a change going on there, too, about the role that technology will play. So, okay. so, yeah, no, here I am. Here I am. I right. just actually had to take my dog out. He's been scratching on the door. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, yeah I know, Computers right? Computers resetting. Co- exactly, care of exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so, so um, you, you have a unique but growing uh, circumstance that you report to the CEO. 
Uh, do you have, you mentioned the board conversation. Have you had the opportunity to actually engage with the boards as well in your role? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, I sit on like we have, our board does have the ma management attends most of the board meetings. I mean, there are in-camera sessions that we, that we won't, won't attend, but they're generally the topics, particularly right now, because we're going through the 2022 to 2026 year planning. And to get that interlock with the board, to get them in sync with, is this, because cooperatives, I mean, we have a certain identity in the marketplace and yeah. what we want to, you know, what, what we want to, what themes we're going to, or where we're going to place our bets, that type of thing. So hearing that firsthand is really valuable to help myself help set strategy with my team. Yeah. You know, how they are thinking about things. Yeah. So as, as you described this evolution of the role and how, mm -hmm. um, it's now structurally changed too. So the CEO, re CIO reports to CEO and gets a chance to be actually present at the board and, and describe things to the board and educate the board. That actually, mm -hmm. I know that that requires the different skill sets, right? Different, right. different attributes. So I'd love for you to, like, if, if you were to project sort of where the role is going to be going and, and for those who are listening, who are, who are you know, planning, thinking or aspiring, to become successful top executives in technology, what might be those attributes that you would think are critical for the next decade for the CIO of the future? I think, um, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, one of them is to make, I know it's gonna sound kind of, but it's to make them feel comfortable with the dialogue, to be able to, to, to talk to them like, I mean, Technology has a lot of acronyms. I mean, we've grown yeah. up in a world of acronyms, but it's humanizing that conversation and being able to present, I think, either results or plans in a very business manner, linking it to the business objectives of what we're trying to accomplish. That I mean, having that that telling the story, but telling it, you said it earlier, telling it in what in words that they're going to not only understand, but comprehend and, and embrace, by the way, yeah. to, to say, hey, look, this really sounds like, and, and it's building a certain confidence because if you look at P&Ls within a lot of companies, the, the tech organizations represent a big portion of their spend. And yeah. uh, it's always interesting to know, so how are, we, how are we spending that? How are we governing that and that type of thing? And then being able to tell that not just the story about that, but also how are we, managing our, our tech as a business, like how bus it's a business within cooperators as this example, and how does that business support the businesses that we, we provide? And how do mm -hmm. we, everything from brokering services to enabling systems, that type of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's excellent, excellent. Um, so we have a couple of audience questions. I wanna make sure that we touch on a few that might be interesting for, for audience to, to broadly hear. Um, mm -hmm. You, you are there to transform the organization from a technology perspective. The one interesting question was, how would you define a successful transformation? What would success of the transformation look like? Mm. Well, that's a tough question. I think we're trying to think, I think we're trying to put those, those yardsticks or measurements in place as we speak today, because there, there's a from to in this conversation, understanding in, in, you know, in pretty granular fashion, like where are we today? A proper current state assessment. Yeah. And then painting that too. So what are we, what are we moving to? And then understanding what are the, I don't know if you want to call it five or six steps. Like, what are you going to, what are you going to have to do differently to get there? Yeah. And my sense is, is that, and it's not, I don't think it's just unique to us. It's really being able to paint that future, but also understand it's not revolutionary. I mean, because mm. organizations, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it takes yeah. it takes time. I mean, there's there's an alignment between change management, talent strategy, technology uh, availability. There's there's a lot of moving parts to that con to how how you can pace and do velocity sort of thing. And I think you know successful people are going to get that right. I mean, and and be there might be a, there might be a bit of an under promise over deliver opportunity here but but to be quite pragmatic about what you think it's actually going to take and not be bashful about you know saying this and it's not free it's that's something that it, there's uh you know we've used this at and you know we've used this for a long time how do you change the wheels on the train while it's moving well that's kind of still true right and yep. so it's a question of 
and there's an, and there's also typically an implicit investment to be had to be able to get you to that brave new world as you're currently because nobody's going to be taken off the hook to deliver what they've been asked to do in the next six months so you got to figure it out both right how am i going to get this done and get that done and 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 what i find intriguing about this is i love to think about ideas so what do we how do we create capacity how do we be able to, to fund something like this without without necessarily going you know uh, to the board and ask for a whole bunch of because i actually believe there's a there's opportunities Within large organizations, there's so many good things going on. And if you can find out what those are mm. and be able to you know, expand them across other, other organizations, other businesses, opportunities, there's, there's a self-funding piece of this conversation yeah. that people yeah. don't necessarily often recognize, but that's something I look for all the time. Yeah, this, this is excellent. This is excellent. Thank you. Another interesting question about the transformation that you're leading. The question is, um, as, as you think about it and discuss it with think operators, are you classifying the transformation as an IT transformation or is it a business transformation? Uh, and that is it understood and appreciated to be that this or that? And then the follow up was how like do you have any tips on how to continue getting executive support and executive buy in and keeping them because you know that, that's often challenge too. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so on your first question, it's I, it's business led. I, I, that's how I would describe it because we see ourselves. I mean, if you, I think if you read our annual report about where we're going as an organization, there is an implicit business transformation messaging in in that. So, I mean, one of the things is is so for us, it's like so, and it, that positioning is important. So, how do we enable that transformation, which requires us in technology to transform? I mean, we've had a recent, um, you know, interlock with the business where we're talking about, well, given the business drivers, given the business goals, where do we see ourselves as being key enablers for that? And then the next look is to say, do we have the capability to do it? So we understand the what, but do we get the how understood? So, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I, like I said earlier in the conversation, very much business led. But again, I also acknowledge that technology if we're if we're really doing our jobs well, we're acting as true consultants on how tech can actually shape those or can deliver those business strategies. I mean, from a from a contribution perspective too. So having that very tight business relationship management with the business and become not I mean move from I wouldn't say we're order takers. I'm not saying that, but move to be true consultants within the business to help them achieve what they're trying to accomplish so 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 this is an important one harry i just want to build just a little bit on this uh so we are tracking at deloitte the evolution of the role and doing surveys globally and so mm -hmm. here is the latest articulation we went through the order taker that's been 20 years ago then we we went yep. into the phase of partnering with the business so we have business partners but the latest research suggests that there is a new role shaping for leading CIOs. We call it kinetic leader, the one who mm. moves forward the business areas. And I think what you're describing is exactly that. It's being the kinetic leader is understanding the business and coming to business with well thought out ideas on how could they leverage technology to move their needle forward. Mm -hmm. That is a step beyond being a being a partner that's something yeah, different. and 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 it's it's like seeing a smile on their face when you show up in their office because they know yeah that you're there you know not to you know not to say no but say you know how can i help like in, in, a, in a very meaningful way but also providing the consultative skills to point out to them that's a really great aspiration but here's some key things you might want to consider around that and it's really helping them to figure out, to know what they don't know in some of those strategies that are going to be very helpful as a team player to say, that's a great idea. And here's the, here's a way to enable that. And here's the things we need to consider. Yeah. And you, you, you get that through, you know, a very good relation, like kinetic relationship where yeah. people know that you're, you know, you're there for them. If you, yeah. um, I, I want to be respectful of our time. Maybe, maybe one more question for you to react to. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned something that is, I think, also very important. These transformations are actually not revolutions. They are <laughs> essentially evolutions, right? 
-hmm. So there is this, the question that came is, is interesting, that the difference between, you know, the, the concept of change versus reinvention, and right. are there any tips on how you manage and communicate within both your team members and business units to balance this tension between dreaming the reinvention and executing on, on, on change, like right? that balance between yeah. evolution, revolution, expectations, and so forth. Any, any comment on that? Any reaction to that? Well, I think that every, every organization should have a North Star. An aspirational, yep. like where do, like like where where is it? Like where, where what's what does the holy grail look like? So first point, second point is is that the communication aspect of what you just described is a huge challenge because, I mean, we're not the biggest game in town, but we have roughly a thousand people that are in the, involved in the technology organization. So how do you get a thousand people synchronized on the same yeah. messaging, on the same run of play, etc.? So one of the larger challenges is to be able to paint the North Star. And then, and then what, what, what we hear from our people is, I want to better understand how I fit into the delivery of that strategy. So it's a lot of work. I mean, it, it translates into, that's why it's evolutionary, not revel. And at the point in time when you say that to them, they may find out that maybe the role I'm doing today isn't the role of the future. So, and, and in creating a comfort level that, don't worry, we're going to retool, we're going to retrain, we're going to, we're going to get there together for those who want to do it. Because I'm a strong believer that careers are planned not collectively. There's not something that I unilaterally bring down messages that this is how you're going to manage your career. I think you have, Dalibor, as an example, this is what you need to do. This is how you contribute to where you want to be successful in the future. And hopefully you have an interlock of how that's going to happen successfully. Yeah based on the, the, what we just talked about, if you will. Yeah. Uh, Harry, this was fantastic. I think, uh, like, I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, congratulations on such a successful career. I look forward to staying connected. Um, yeah, I do too. And and uh, and for, for our audience members, just heads up that uh, we're going to have a very interesting conversation live again in a few weeks. So I wanted to let you know about this, and then I'll send you all an email to if you can register. We're going to actually change the tone slightly, and next time we are going to talk about recruitment. And I have a privilege of uh, welcoming Lisa Porlier. She's the managing director of. Uh, Russell Reynolds, uh, one of Canada's premier executive search firms, and she runs the technology executive search for Canada. So we're going to spend an hour with Lisa, getting her perspectives on the Canadian market for technology executives, some interesting stories, and of course, like always, your questions. So with that, Harry, thank you so very much. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. It has absolutely been a pleasure and all mine. And uh, okay. <laughs> for, all, for audience members, we are going to actually assemble a video out of these two uh, uh, two elements. And I'm going to be yeah. sending you the link uh, over the next couple of days. I want to thank you all very much for your attention. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Same channel, same days, same time. Have a lovely Wednesday, everyone. Thank you, Delabor. Bye-bye.